The, the topic tonight is multiband HF antennas. The, the way this came up, there, there was a lot of interest from a number of folks in antennas in general and the classic D5 RV because I think several people either had them or have them. What I'm going to be talking about in general is a subset of all the, the wire antennas that's, that they are out there in the world. These are center-fed antennas that are based on the classic dipole. Characteristics are a single feed line, several amateur bands without switching, reasonable in-band SWR and good efficiency, typically two support ends. I'm not looking at slopers in this case. These are all flat tops and uh, a coax connection to the transceiver. The an antennas that I looked at are the G5RV, a cousin of the G5RV, ZS6BKW, a fan dipole, a commercial multi-band sort of fan dipole with a loading coil, the DXCC that's made by Alpha Delta, and a trap dipole. Throughout this, I went through uh, some of the same kinds of, of analyses for each of them. First, the G5RV. This is a relatively old design. It was first described by Lewis Varney, who G5RV in 1946. It's a center-fed single wire with an impedance matching transformer, which is a ladder line section hung down from the center. When he designed it, he really designed it as a, a 20 meter antenna at uh, the center frequency of 1415. And at that, it has a wavelength and a half. And his uh, thoughts on doing this is that he'd get more actual physical antenna out there uh, with higher efficiency. And it does have lobes in it so that if you point it in a certain direction, you get a little more radiation off of those directions. The, the one thing it does have going for it that's very good for DX is has a low angle of radiation, about 14 degrees, so it's very good for, for that. He intended the antenna to be used with a tuner, and in fact, you have to use a tuner on it and any band other than the 20 meter. It has some advantages. It's a single wire multi-band. It's very simple. It does cover the bands from 80 to 10 meters and actually will work on six meters as well. There are no traps or coils. It's a flap top, can be used as an inverted V, and it's not too big. It's a little bit shorter than a standard 80 meter dipole. The disadvantages are that none of the covered amateur bands has a an SWR below two and actually most of them have SWRs well in excess of that more on the order of five or, or uh, and above so an, an antenna tuner unit has to be used probably even should be used on 20 meters because the, the bandwidth on 20 meters is fairly narrow this is what it looks like like I said it's about 102 feet long uh, you have a ladder line in the center originally the design was for this ladder line to be 525 ohms and Varney made his own the ladder section here is 34 feet and then at this point down here, it's hooked to 50 ohm coax back to the transceiver. This is what the calculated SWR looks like. And I've highlighted the popular bands here that it covers. So you can see the 80 and 40. The resonances are actually somewhat far off from it. Got a nice uh, low value, but it turns out it's well above the amateur band. Does cover the other ones on up to 15 meters with the, with the tuner and, and 12 meters. I didn't put the 6 meters on here, but uh, you'll see a little later I did something for one of the derivative antennas. This is what the far field elevation plot looks like uh, at 20 meters, and it's got this very nice desirable radiation off at a fairly low angle and not much vertically, so most of the energy is going out into the field where you want it. The azimuth pattern is a little complicated. There are these nulls in the pattern and got two prominent lobes that move up in those directions. The gain is not too bad. It's about 6 dBi, but there are antennas that'll, that will do better than that. This is the listing of the patterns. I got this from the internet, from LB Cebic in a, a publication called the G5 RV Revisited. And you see that it's got sort of a classic pattern for dipoles it, and it starts to get more complicated as you go on up and this, this is the 10 meter and you got some very pronounced nulls in this. So it would be good in certain directions certain directions they probably wouldn't get much response. As I said, the G5 RV is purported to cover five or more bands. Well, the problem with that is the SWR and all those bands except 20 meters is really pretty high, and most of the bands have SWRs of five or greater. Satisfactory operation requires an antenna tuner, and the far field response at the higher frequencies is pretty complicated. I'm sure you all know this, certainly why SWR is important. You say, I got an antenna tuner, and I got it up right next to the transceiver, so I'm getting all these really fantastically low SWR readings into my transceiver, you know, the, the power amplifier is happy. Why am I not happy? The answer is feed line losses. If you run 100 feet or a couple hundred feet of coax, if it's not very, very low loss coax, uh, you're going to start to lose a significant amount of power. For instance, if you had an antenna hooked up with 100 feet of Belden 9913 with an SWR of one and a half, feed line loss is six tenths of a dB. Well, that means your efficiency is about 87%. And that's pretty good. Put 100 watts in, 
in, you get about 86 watts into the antenna. That doesn't say anything about the antenna efficiency. This is just into the antenna. If, on the other hand, your SWR at the antenna, regardless of what the SWR at the transceiver is, is 10, your feed line loss is going to be now 2.2 dB, and you're only going to get an efficiency of about 60%. So you'll get 60 watts out to the antenna. With its high SWR, the G5 RV is going to result in significant feed line losses if you have any kind of length of coax in between at all. This is a, a chart that shows the feed line loss versus SWR, and you can see here that for low SWRs, down to 3 or 5, you get a reasonable amount of power out. By the time you get up in the 13 to 15 range, which some of the, the bands on the G5 RV would be, and perhaps even more, you're starting to lose significant amounts of power, down approaching 50%. So it's not really a very desirable kind of antenna for most of the band. Al, if you were able to put the transmitter right at the end of that ladder line, uh, would, that, would that eliminate that inefficiency? Yes, and one of the ways to do this is to get one of the ATU units that mounts at the, the end of the, the antenna. And so that would that would work out real well. So that would eliminate the feed line loss? Yes. Now, well, eliminate it, but it'll, it'll minimize it because you're going to still get a little bit no matter what. Two problems with that. One is they're expensive. You know, they're four or $500 at a minimum. And secondly, they don't come in high power version. I think, what is it, Lyle? 100 watts? 100 watts, 150 watts, about it. Yeah. So it's really, really a great idea if you're running fairly low power. If you've got a 600 watt transmitter, that's not the way to go. There's a better solution to that rather than using the G5 RV. And that is, there are a number of cousins, a number of variations on the G5 RV. Probably the best of these is one that was designed by Brian Austin, and he happens to be ZS6 BKW. It's based on the G5 R RV. He used computer optimization to modify the dimensions and some of the other parameters to come up with a much better performing antenna. Only the dimensions and the ladder line impedance were changed. Configuration is exactly the same as it was before. And in fact, it's a little shorter than uh, the 102 uh, feet. Uh, this is what it looks like. You compare the uh, dimensions. The G5 RV is 102 feet. The, the, uh, the ZS is 92 feet. He used 400 ohms for this. I did some modeling and changed some of the, the characteristics to use a 450 ohm ladder line, which is pretty easily come by. And it doesn't change much else uh, and actually comes out with a pretty good result. This is a slightly modified antenna, which has got some real good characteristics. And voila, they come up with the SWR plot. And you can tune these things so it's pretty much bang on on 40, 20, 12, 10, you can put the, the resonance at six meters within the, the broad six meter band. Six meters is pretty wide. It does okay on 17. 17 is very narrow, so it's not quite as good for 17, but it does a pretty decent job. 80 meters, you got a pretty high SWR. You can see right below the band, it's about nine. So it's not really ideal for 80 meters, but it does looks like a pretty good job for all the rest of them. And on some of them, as you can see here on 40 and 20, the center of the band SWR is, is really quite good. I tune the, the thing so it, it would match up this way. And you do two things to tune it. One is you look at what the L1 is, and that hits several of these bands, and then the L2 does several of the others. And again, I used 450 ohms on this because it's ladder line that you can commercially come up with. If you want to homebrew your own and make a 400, you can do that as well. Brian Austin did some uh, sensitivity studies on this uh, particular antenna to see what the range of sizes would be for the L1 and L2, and he came up with this envelope where the SWR was two, two to one or better on five of the bands, not including the 80 meters. And he just are, are sort of arbitrarily picked this because it was it worked with the 400 ohms and he came up with these combinations and meters of, of the size. I used 450 ohms, so I did a little bit of tweaking on it. You'll see the dimensions on that a, a little later, but it works really well. These are some of the far field responses at the three lowest bands. And you see the, uh, the the first two of them here pretty much are classic kind of dipoles. And this one starts to get a little bit more of the, on 20 meters of the characteristics that the G5 RV had. Again, real nice low angle takeoff there. A little higher center hump, but still not too bad. And the higher bands have a little bit lower gain. You, you notice that the gain over here in these plots is all the same. And by the way, the gain looks to be a little bit higher on this because you see I've got 9.32 dB on this. This one, but you still get the, the fairly nice low takeoff angles on this, so it probably would be pretty good in DX uh, for most of the, the bands. This is the um, azimuth angle, the, the low bands 
you tend to get pretty nice even distribution. And the higher bands, you got some of the nulls, but it's not zero, so that's pretty good. And I did a, a propagation thing, which I'll show you a little later, which indicates that's probably not all that critical. The higher bands get even more complicated, as you would expect, uh, because you're getting the higher harmonics of, of the resonance. But it turns out the you know the gain on some of these is actually pretty good. This is the six meter, and six meter comes out to have a pretty low SWR. I suspect that by carefully tuning some of the, the resonance, you could stick this harmonic a little closer to the center of the band, but so they got a fairly narrow bandwidth in any case. But your, your tuner would take care of, of a lot of that. This is probably a very good alternative, the G5RV. And if you had a G5RV, you could convert it to this by getting the 450 ohm ladder line and shortening the thing up a little bit. The second one was a fan dipole. Fan dipole is very simple. Uh, it's not so simple to mount it, but it's simple to model because actually you have, in this case, three different dipoles all hooked together at common points in the center. Coax right here in the center and the three points come together at a node and then you get feed line across that. This is the model for anybody who's into that. Here's what you get with the fan dipole. Now the, the way the fan dipole works is that the dipole has a certain characteristic impedance and the impedance at the off resonance frequencies tends to be very high. So they're all effectively isolated from each other. And if you got one of the legs cut for 80 meters, one for 40 and one for 20. And you get along for free the 15, but that's pretty much it on this. Now I could have added another one. As you start to get more and more of these little dipoles, if they're all coplanar, they tend to interfere with each other a little bit. And I've seen some designs out there for guys who've got plenty of acreage in the back and don't mind having uh, clotheslines all over, where you can run these things sort of in a, a radial pattern and you keep them apart and they would work very well that way. So you've got the advantages of a single feed line in this case and you cover the, the, the bands and you cover them really well. If you look at this, you get nice, nice coverage with low SWRs and fairly good bandwidth. So the, uh, the whole band is covered with reasonable SWRs in case, uh, say, under 5 for the 80 meter and uh, similar for 40. So this is a really nice design if, you could, if you've got the space and, and the ability to hang one of them. The problem is getting all of the, the wires to work uh, really well. These are the patterns. They, they tend to look all like dipoles on the, the ones where you've got the, the dipoles all cut. And so I, I didn't run any of the, the other ones uh, for this one. The other neat thing about this is that being a dipole, it's got pretty good high gain. So you can see the gain on this is, is fairly decent. So it's 11 here and probably a 6 or 7 for these, these other ones. So they should be pretty good performers, as you would expect. The next one I did is the Alpha Delta DXCC and runs about 150 bucks. So it isn't cheap, but it's well made. It's easy to put up. It's easy to tune. It's fundamentally a fan dipole and you can do it in either a flat top or you can do it in a, a sloper kind of arrangement. I model the, the flat top uh, arrangement. It, it's one long wire with a loading coil in between and two other intermediate wires, which are cut for the other bands. A loading coil shortens it up. So it's the shortest antenna of the bunch at about 82 feet. And it works really well on 80, 40, and 20. And so sort of okay on the on the other two, which are harmonics of, of some of the lower bands. This is the model. I'm not gonna go through this in detail. The only tricky part about doing one of these models is getting the loading coil information. And what I actually did was measure the coil on mine and calculated the inductance of the coil based on the windings and the size. I just guessed at what the capacitance would be and assumed there was no resistance in there. And it worked out uh, pretty well. This is, again, the, the calculated value. I happen to have one, and so I was able to measure the antenna, and these are the, uh, the results for that. And then if you put those together, you see that you get a pretty good correspondence between them. The characteristics of this thing are that it has a very narrow bandwidth at 80 meters, and that's something that happens when you have a loaded antenna. Typically, the bandwidth is reduced greatly. So at the ends of the 80 meter uh, band, you're going to end up having to use a tuner. The other ones follow along pretty well, and not, not too bad. I could have probably tuned this a little bit more so it would have come out exactly with where it was on the uh, on the other, but you know, I was happy with the correlation. These are the Farfield Azimuth, again, what you'd expect from dipoles, and I compared then the DXCC with the ZS, and the differences are, are interesting. At uh, 40 and 20, they're almost exactly the same, which you expect because they're kind of, they're both designed for those areas. The, the ZS <laughs> will have resonances at different places. Now, they both do the 10, the uh, 15 meter works for the DXCC and the 17 and the 12 work for the ZS. So, you know, you got your choice of what bands you'd, you'd like to be able to use, but uh, that's kind of a, a comparison. The third one I did was a, was a trap dipole. Now, the way trap dipoles work, what you do is you add in one or more parallel LC circuits in the line. And what the LC circuits do is basically provide an isolation between elements in the line. So you actually have one wire with one or more of these LC traps in the line. So you feed it from a center point and hopefully that's something in the neighborhood of 50 ohms. The trap
that can be fairly easily constructed using coils wound from coax. And there's a ton of stuff out there on the internet about how to do this, uh, along with calculators that will uh, allow you to make this. And you can use uh, Schedule 40 pipe, wind your own coils. They're fairly re re uh, robust. The way I found, and there's, there's a little bit of controversy about this, that most of the stuff on the internet is not clear about where you put the, the trap LC resonance frequency. They just said you should go measure it with a grid dip meter, and they don't tell you what it is. Well, if you read between the lines, you see that most of the people suggest that the isolated L and C circuit, if it's taken off of the antenna, should be centered on the band that you want to, uh, to isolate it. And the way you, you do one of these things is uh, you go ahead and construct the uh, trap and then trim it using some kind of uh, a meter that you can measure. An SWR meter, a lot of the ones like the ones made from MJF have this capability. The, the antennas typically are shorter than a single dipole, but the, the problem is that the resonance bandwidth is pretty narrow compared to the dipole. So again, they're fine right in the center of the band, but when you get away from that, then you've got to use a tuner. This is uh, an example of the uh, band. They actually center up pretty nicely because I, I designed this one for three bands, and these all fall real well within those bands. A little higher SWR on uh, the, the 40 meter, but that, that really not is not critical at all. The thing that is critical, though, is that these are all very narrow, and so at band ends, you're starting to get up into some of the higher SWR values. Okay, that's fine. What about propagation? There's one of the programs out there. It's this free one that, that's available. That's the 4NEC2. Now, we'll use uh, the models and allows you to do some predictions under the conditions that you can set into them on what the propagation patterns will look like. This is one of them for the, the ZS. In the center here, what I've done is I've shown what the lobes look like and then all these colors on the outside give some idea of what the readings would be if you were out in the field. 115 here, I think, is something on the order of uh, about S7 or S8. 103 on this would be an S9. And you see that you do get higher readings out here where the lobes are the largest. So here, are, these are all where the lobes are, and you do get more propagation out in those areas. There seems to be a skip zone in this, and then you get some stuff out in uh, the other was probably bouncing uh, another time. Very little pickup in the close-in area, so an antenna like this would be terrible for the, the Ohio Park. Uh, because you wouldn't get anything much in here. This is this is S1 down here in, in, in the white, so it, uh, it doesn't do a good job there. This is what the, the DXCC looks like, and these are both at 20 meters. Again, what you see is where the lobes are tend to get more radiation. Now, the interesting thing on, the, on this one is that this area out in here is actually broader because the lobe is a lot broader, but you get these null areas in the, in the other direction. So on this one, if you wanted to talk to Canada, you'd be probably uh, hurting depending on what orientation the antenna had. The, the remarkable thing about it is that the coverage for these back and forth is pretty much the same. So at 20 meters anyway, there's not a lot of difference between the, the two in terms of uh, what you get for under these conditions. Now, you can run these charts. There's a lot of variations in there depending on the time of day and what the propagation conditions are that they, they assume. The only way I see that these are really valuable is to look at one antenna compared to another antenna under identical conditions, which is what, what this is. These are some bandwidth comparisons. A lot of data here. I'm not going to go through this in a lot of detail, except to point out that on some of them, like, for instance, the DXCC here, you notice that the uh, the bandwidth uh, at the, the band end ends, well, the, the, the SWR values can be fairly high. Some of them are a little better, the fan di dipoles. So the way I did, these are the SWR values uh, at the minimums and at the band edge. You go through all that stuff, we'll start to talk through a little bit about the advantages and disadvantages of each of them. The G5RV, and this is probably, and you can say the same for the, the ZS, simple, easy to construct. This is one that you can really readily make at home if you want to, and it wouldn't cost very much. The ladder line, because you have to buy probably a large amount of it, wouldn't uh, would be set you back the most. See so any wire, about 100 feet, about 50 feet of the ladder line, and that's it. Not mentioning the supports. Downsides of the G5 RV, again, requires an ATU almost across the board. The ZS, simple. It's pretty good on 40, 20, 17, 12, 10, and 6, and it's relatively short length. It's only 92 feet. Complicated far field pattern, but that probably doesn't mean too much. It doesn't cover 80 meters real well. Fan <laughs> dipole we talked about, it's really good on the covered bands. It's a little complicated to build one because of the wire support, but it would be really cheap because it's just wire. It's a little longer. Now, it's going to be the longest one because it's an uncut dipole at the uh, half wave dipole at the uh, lowest. So it's 126 feet. The DXCCC, it performs as they suggest it should. Good SWR on all the bands. I can attest to the fact that it's really easy to tune so you can change the length of all of those fan pieces in there. 80 meters because it's got a loading coil in it. It's got a fairly narrow bandwidth. A little harder to uh, 
the homebrew because of the coil, but if anybody wanted to try that, you know, I can give you the dimensions for mine, and it would be pretty simple. There's no capacitor involved, it's just a coil on a, on a uh, form. Trap dipole, this is the most complicated one to build if you were going to do that. Pretty good SWR on the covered bands. It's got narrow band widths, and it requires these LC traps, and it's it's fairly short as well. It, it's not as long as the other one. So that's kind of where we are on, on the advantages and disadvantages. Summary, uh, <coughs> I say all the antennas except the G5RV do really well without an ATU. The 80 meter band almost across the board except to find the fan dipole bandwidth is fairly narrow. The original G5RV is not the best solution. I would say that a ZS, if you're going to build one of these things, is really a, a pretty good way to go. It's simple. It probably works very well. And, you know, for simplicity, it's hard to beat, particularly if you've got an ATU you can use on, on 80 meters. The final comment on all this, LB Civic, who was sort of the, the antenna modeling guru, if you've done any looking out on the, uh, the internet, he's got... He's got a website that is exceedingly extensive. It's got hundreds of models. They sell a, uh, a CD with, I think, 800 different models on it. And so, but he says that of all of the G5 RV antenna systems, Cousins, the, the ZS antenna comes the closest to achieving the goal as part of the, the G5 RV mythology, which is a multi-band HF antenna consisting of a single wire and a simple single matching system to cover as many of the HF bands as is possible. That's that's kind of the uh, the final word the the guru has spoken. For those of you who want to follow up on this. These are some of the, uh, the references that I looked at. There are actually more, but these are the most important ones. You can find out all kinds of stuff about the G5RV and the ZS, as well as other kind of multi-band uh, antennas. And there's some stuff in there about how to build uh, coaxial trap dipoles and how to do line loss calculations. So,